Okay, oscillations then. An oscillation is anything that's got a repeated to and fro motion. All right, so when I use the word oscillation, that's what I'm talking about. Um, so, you know, there, there are things obviously out there in the world where that's fairly evident, right? Waves on the ocean we can describe as oscillations, that's fine. Uh, a Mexican wave in a football stadium actually isn't because it's not a repeated to and fro motion, it's a pulse, all right? It's one thing that travels around the stadium. Right? Actually, to get an oscillation going in a stadium requires a lot of coordination. It's the sort of thing you get at Olympics opening ceremonies, not at the average football match. Um, so bear that in mind, that is not an oscillation, it's not actually a wave, uh, it's a pulse. But you know that's, that's technical physics-y stuff that you might not want to share uh, with your friends when you are talking about football matches. Um, now, as I said, we're, we're going to need a little bit of trigonometry to talk about waves, because essentially all of the things, all of the oscillations we're going to look at, we're going to be able to describe as sinusoidal, all right? which means we can describe them using sines and cosines. Now, it's not, you know, this is not complicated. Um, we really are literally talking about you know, anything that adopts that sort of shape. Um, that is a sinusoidal wave, subject to the quality of my drawing skills, right, which you're well aware of. Um, <coughs> now, waves carry energy, uh, but they don't carry matter. So when we're looking at, you know, the vibration of a I don't know, guitar string, any musical instrument, uh, to produce a note, all right, there is displacement, the string is vibrating, but there is no transport of matter along the wave, right? The guitar string doesn't all end up at the fret at one end of the guitar. Uh, likewise, uh, waves on a pond, all right? There is oscillation, there is movement of water, but actually it's movement up and down to create the wave, all right? The wave doesn't transport the water out to the edge of the pond, for instance, if you started the wave in the middle. So we're carrying energy, quite evidently there's energy, something has to be moving the guitar string or the water, uh, but we're not actually, that energy is not transporting uh, the matter. That's quite an important principle to hang on to. And everything we're going to be talking about uh, in this module will be a progressive wave. Right, which simply means that the wave travels, actually not everything, there is an exception to that. But all that means is that the wave shape is moving in time, in space, uh, from one point to another. Um, and as I say, we're going to look a lot at sound, we're going to look at a lot of uh, electromagnetic waves as well, light and, and radio waves and so on. Um, uh, so initially it's going to be mechanical waves. So we can think in terms of vibrations on a guitar string, on a spring, in water, right? Uh, in air actually if we're using sound, that's a mechanical wave. It it's, it's actually involves uh, an oscillation of a material substance. Right? As distinct from an electromagnetic wave, which is not. Right? That is a variation in the field strength of electric and magnetic fields. So it doesn't involve matter at all. Right? Quite a, again, quite an important uh, distinction. So what have we got? We've got mechanical progressive waves. That's what we're talking about so far. And we're now going to subdivide them again into two classes. Uh, and one is the transverse wave, the other is the longitudinal wave. And they're very straightforward definitions. A transverse wave uh, is where the disturbances, the oscillations in other words, are occurring uh, at right angles to the wave motion. Yeah? So that's, um, uh, what are we doing? We've got a piece of string on the desk and we're sort of waggling it from side to side. We're going to get a wave motion going along the string but the particles in the string are actually moving at right angles to that. Right? So waves going that way, particles moving that way. That's a transverse wave. Um, 
the oscillation of a mass on the end of a spring is, is the illustration in the diagram. Okay, so the wave, if you trace it out, is in time moving out from the mass as it moves up and down, but the mass is only ever moving up and down. We'll come back to these as illustrations later on. Uh, whereas a longitudinal wave is something like sound waves, for instance, as an example, right, which are pressure waves. So we get zones of compression, zones of rarefaction. Uh, and it's most easily imagined with a loudspeaker cam, the sort of thing that's illustrated schematically in the diagram here on the screen. So the speaker cone is vibrating, oscillating backwards and forwards. Right? So as it's moving forwards, it's producing high pressure <coughs> regions in the air. As it's moving back, it's <coughs> producing rare fractions or low pressure regions in the air. And those just move out from the loudspeaker cone. So we've now got oscillations of air molecules that are in the same direction as the direction in which the wave is travelling. <coughs> yeah? Um, now, hopefully this link works. We'll have a look. Uh, but it's actually quite useful just to illustrate what's going on here. Right, so here's our longitudinal wave on the screen. And there's a couple of very usefully labelled particles in whatever this medium is supposed to be. Uh, they're just labelled as red. Uh, but this is the loudspeaker cone type analogy, all right? It's a piston at the end of the tube, basically. It's just moving backwards and forwards. So this is slow motion sound coming out of your loudspeaker, if you want to think of it that way. So as it moves forward, it's basically compressing air molecules. As it moves back, uh, it's causing uh, low pressure zones. And these high and low pressure zones are now <coughs> propagating outwards as a wave. All right? So the wave direction is most definitely on that screen uh, left to right. Okay? No question about that. But you'll notice the individual particles in here, these things usefully uh, coloured red here, for instance, all they're doing is oscillating backwards and forwards. They are not themselves wholesale moving left to right along the screen. When you turn on a loudspeaker, activate a loudspeaker in your room, it does not clear the room of air, right? which is actually quite a useful thing. Uh, all that's happening is that the air molecules are oscillating backwards and forwards. Uh, it is an oscillation because it's a repeated motion to and fro. Right? That was our definition of what an oscillation was. This is a longitudinal wave because the oscillation is in the same direction as the wave motion. Right? So this is our longitudinal wave. Um, if we go down the screen, yeah, here we are. We've got a transverse wave. Right? So it's the same sort of process. Unfortunately, now without red dots that we can follow. So I don't know how good your eyes are, but you can pick one, like this one, for instance. It's just all it's doing is moving up and down and up and down. Right? But that produces a wave motion. Again, the wave motion, if you follow a crest, is moving left to right. But the displacement of the particles involved in it, the oscillations, are actually just up and down. So they're at right angles to the wave motion. That's what makes this a transverse wave. So this is the sort of thing we think about when we're looking at you know, waves on water, for instance. Okay, that is a transverse wave. Good. And I've got, I don't know how many of that, two, three, four slides, I can't remember, but just, you know, further pictures. A lot of them taken out of your recommended course textbook uh, and other textbooks, just to illustrate these same principles, because they're absolutely foundational um, to what we understand about a wave. All right, so in that first one, we've got oscillations labelled with letters and colours and so on and it's simply illustrating again the fact that you know the particles are not moving with the wave they're oscillating backwards and forwards but not being transported with the wave um, 
I don't have a slinky spring. I should really try and buy one because they look like fun. Uh, but you can illustrate both longitudinal and trans transverse waves you know, with, a, with a big spring. Right? You can produce a pressure wave just by oscillating along its length, as it were, and watch the pressure waves traveling. Uh, and you can do a transverse wave, obviously, if you lay it down on a bench or something just by moving it backwards and forwards uh, in the plane of the bench. It gets a little bit tricky, actually. Uh, these are slightly cheating as diagrams. Uh, anyone who's actually tried it, you'll know that you get an effect. Because there's a bank end, as it were, to your spring, you'll actually get some a form of reflection of your wave going on. And we'll come back to reflected waves later in the in the module, but it does tend to mess this up after a while. But it's you know as a thought experiment, it's quite useful. So here's a page of definitions for you. This is pretty much the only page of definitions you're going to get. Uh, everything that's important in terms of the symbols and so on we're going to use is on this slide. So once and once only, as it were. Um, and essentially, I'm just trying to define words for you. So a cycle is a complete to and fro motion. It's one complete oscillation, in other words. right? That's all a cycle is. Uh, and the period, then, is the time that it takes to complete that one cycle. Right? And that's going to be measured in, in seconds. I won't surprise you. Um, a frequency, however, is the number of those uh, cycles that are undertaken in a unit of time, so in a second. All right, so if T is the period for one cycle, then the frequency is actually going to end up being just 1 over T. Okay, so that's our first equation. F is equal to 1 over T. Um, the displacement, well, we've talked about displacements already of particles in those uh, animations, for instance, those cartoons. Uh, it is just uh, the distance of our oscillating object from its equilibrium position. And the equilibrium position, uh, very similarly to our equilibrium separation between atoms, is, you know, in the absence of putting any energy in, where will that particle be? So on the guitar string, it will be along the line of the guitar string. Right? It's only when you pluck the guitar string that you get displacement happening. Uh, and the amplitude then is just the maximum displacement. So if we're looking at mechanical waves, both of those are going to be measured in meters. They are a distance, a distance from equilibrium. Once we move to electromagnetic waves, where we're looking at strengths of magnetic and electric fields, obviously meters are no longer going to be our useful measure. We can be looking at the strength of the magnetic field, not a distance from an equilibrium position. Uh, but for now, while we're looking at mechanical waves, this is, uh, this is the way we're going to go. And then we have something called an angular frequency. All right? Our frequency that we introduced right at the top of the screen was just 1 over t. All right? It's the number of cycles completed per second. The angular fre frequency is actually um, in radians per second. And this is coming from the fact that we will explore uh, later on in the module that we're actually going to try, in fact we will succeed, uh, in relating the motion of something around a circle to a sinusoidal oscillation. And actually once we establish that link, that's really, really useful because we can use all the maths that we can get out of things going uniformly around a circle then to describe our sinusoidal waves. Turns out to be extremely useful. So the angular frequency actually is just saying, well, how many times can we go around two pi radians, in other words, come back to our starting position per second? So it's not oscillations per second now. In that sense, it is number of times around a circle in a second. Right? Um, and that's going to turn out to be really, really useful. Because what we're going to find is... Uh, oh, yeah, let's go on. Let's, let's jump ahead a little bit. Right? Don't take this too seriously, because we are going to come back to this in, in more detail later on. But let's just 
look at the progress of this particle as it moves around the circle in terms of the angle that it's carving out right, as it moves around. If we assume that's zero, that's going to be 90 degrees, 180 degrees, and so on. Right? Or pi upon 2 radians, high radians. Yeah? So we're going to, if we're going to relate this to this, one cycle in this sinusoidal curve will take us from here to its nearest equivalent point, which is actually over there. One complete cycle, one wavelength, as we will see. And that is going to correspond to going all the way around here, two pi radians, and coming back to where we started. Yeah? That's the link that we're going to make. So that's actually quite useful, because now we can t describe this, if we borrow the terminology from our circle and apply it to this, we can now talk about this as being, in some sense, two pi radians, from one of these points to the next. Right? And none of this should surprise you greatly. I've already said we're going to describe these curves in terms of sines and cosines and so on. Well, so, hey, we're going to have angles. That's necessarily a part of it. Um, so that's the link we're going to make. In other words, if we traveled round by uh, pi upon two uh, radians, uh, we'd actually be getting to that point up there. That would be our equivalent point on our wave. It would be a quarter of the way through one cycle. Yeah? So, remember that, because it's going to come back at some stage. Uh, and our angular frequency then, as I say, is just how many times we go around 2 pi radians uh, per second. So the phase difference, which is the next thing on our list, is now measuring... Let me try and find some different colour. Here we are. Is now measuring uh, the distance between... Fraction of a cycle, I should say, between... Um, uh, one point on a wave and another point on the wave. Right? So if we're thinking about the particles in those cartoons we looked at earlier, uh, it's the fraction of a cycle that one particle is different to another particle right, in that cartoon. So, if we take this as our reference point again, all right, the phase difference between this of this point on the wave is, if we take our analogy with the circle, pi upon 2 radians, right, or 90 degrees, if you prefer. The phase difference by the time we got round here is pi radians, 180 degrees, it's halfway through the cycle. Um, so that's all the phase difference means, it's just a measure of um, how far apart one point of a wave is from another in terms of whatever cycles are involved. And then the wavelength becomes something that's relatively easy to determine now. Uh, we've gone all the way around one circle, in other words, we've gone all the way from there to there. So in terms of wavelength, that's one wavelength. Right? So it's any point to the next one that's in phase with it. So the next one that's 2 pi uh, away in terms of phase angle. So equivalently, that's also one wavelength. That's just an identical point, the next identical point on the wave. <coughs> so it's from any point to the next identical point, basically. We could act equivalently go back in the other direction. So, for instance, there to there is one wavelength as well. Yeah? And the wave speed, and this is going to be our... Yeah? Is NCU still not here, the speed of light? Uh, no. It's often used as the speed of light, but actually it's a fairly generic symbol for wave speed. So if it's in the context of light, then C becomes the speed of light. If it's in the context of sound, it's the speed of sound. 
but it's it's a generic symbol that you'll find used in the basic wave equation that's relating speed to the other parameters of the wave. Imagine the kind uh, so if it's talking about energy you can see it's the speed of light. If you're talking about waves it's the wave speed. So uh, if you're talking about energy, no. What do you mean in terms of energy? Yeah, but it's in that case it is this, we're, we're talking about it as the speed of light. Yeah. It's not energy. C is never energy. It might be used in an no, equation right. that is related to energy, but but we're never going to be using it in that in that sense. So it's just a generic equation, right? Um, to describe the distance travelled um, by a point on the wave per second. Now, traditionally and easily, and I'm going to slip into this, you know, lazy way of doing it as well because it's it is just convenient. We'll talk about wave crests as our reference point. <coughs> okay particularly if we're talking about mechanical waves. Um, so it's just telling us the distance our wave crest, or actually any reference point on a wave, has moved in one second. Um, and we'll come back to this uh, in a slide or two's time. So again, some more diagrams just illustrating uh, these basic things, uh, including wavelength, so in this case, we've got some circular waves. I don't know, imagine you know, the classic dropping a pebble in the middle of a pond. We get waves coming out from that uh, initial disturbance. A wavelength is the gap between any one of these um, wave crests and the next one to it, either inwards or outwards. Right, same thing. So as I say, we can measure from any reference point to the next one that's in phase with it, and that is a wavelength, that has to be a wavelength. And again, over here, this is simply describing the same sort of thing in the context of, in this case, a longitudinal wave, in this case, a transverse wave. So the displacements are either at right angles to the wave motion or parallel uh, to the wave motion. Either way, we've got displacements that vary sinusoidally, in this case, measured as a function of distance and one wavelength then again distance between uh, a point on the wave and the next nearest one that's in phase with it. So here are two master equations. The one we introduced way back at the top of the um, list of definitions that the period <coughs> of a cycle is 1 over frequency. So the frequency, therefore, is 1 over t, which is why frequency is measured in inverse seconds or hertz as the unit. Uh, and this next equation, which is the wave speed, right? how many cycles, how many wave crests are passing a reference point in a given time, Okay, which is all that refers to. So that will be wavelength over t. Well, 1 over t is f. So the conventional way of writing this equation is just that wave speed is equal to the frequency times the wavelength. So if this was light, c would be the speed of light, f would be the frequency of the light, lambda would be the wavelength of the light. Right? But it applies equally well, as I say, in the context of sound or vibrations on a spring or in water or anything. It's a universal equation from that point of view. Um, okay. Now, obviously, we can plot these things, these waves out in various ways. So, if we've got, you know, this is imagining waves being created on the in the surface of, of water, for instance. This thing is oscillating up and down in the water, producing this sinusoidal wave front um, that's coming out with some speed. All right. So, a certain number of meters per second. We can plot these waves by, I don't know, you know, standing at this particular point, say, the one that's labelled P on that first diagram, uh, and looking at the displacement as a function of time, just at a fixed point in space, right? So we're just staring straight ahead and we're looking at displacement now as a function of time. 
That's all we're doing. Uh, and that is the graph we get. Displacement of a given particle of water molecule, if you like, in this case, uh, will vary uh, from its equilibrium position to the amplitude, maximum positive displacement, back through the equilibrium to the amplitude, negative amplitude, so maximum negative displacement, and then back essentially to its starting position. Right? And because we're measuring this at a fixed point in space, but as a function of time, in other words, as the you know, as the wave is sort of developing in front of us. So particles are oscillating up and down in our water, right, in front of our line of sight. Go back in your imagination to those cartoons we looked at earlier. You're now just looking at a line through that cartoon, and all you're going to be seeing is particles oscillating up and down. And that's what we'll have here. So the displacement then, as a function of time, is going to look sinusoidal. And actually now we're not looking at wavelength here because this isn't a distance on this axis, it's time. So we're actually looking at a period now, which is the time between one crest and the next crest. Okay, if we looked at it in terms of position, so now imagine taking a section through our uh, pond and I don't know what should we do take a flash photograph for instance right so at a point in time we look at the displacement of the water as a function now of distance right along our photograph so through the section that we take and that's what we've got in this graph so here's distance now along this axis we've got exactly the same maximum and negative uh, amplitude of our wave, it's still a sinusoidal shape, but now as a function of uh, position in space rather than as a function of time. Uh, and so now, of course, it is appropriate to talk about this as a wavelength. All right, so period and wavelength are actually describing exactly the same thing. They're describing one cycle. The period's describing it in terms of the time it takes. Wavelength is describing it in terms of the distance that that corresponds to. Yeah? So we're going to look at both those treatments as we go through. But these are our two key equations. Right? Absolutely everything that we talk about in terms of the waves uh, that we will discuss will rely on using those relationships. All right, now we've got some other things that derive out of what we've talked about. This isn't new, this is just sort of, you know, expanding it a little bit. We've already talked about phase difference and what that means, right? We talked about it in terms of this analogy between motion in a circle and our sinusoidal wave, and we're going to pick that up again essentially now. So if we're looking at a phase difference of one cycle, or two pi radians, or 360 degrees, we're talking about moving from, say, here to here, right? Or actually equivalently here to here. It wouldn't matter. It's just you know, a cycle. Or in our circle terms, all the way around one complete revolution. So two points on a wave that are in phase with one another are essentially two points that are separated by two pi radians in this language we've been using, this definition of um, uh, phase separation or phase difference. All right, so that makes them in phase. In other words, that is in phase with that, that is in phase with that, that is in phase with that. Yeah? Because they're one complete cycle. One wavelength, two pi radians. Uh, separated from one another. The converse of that is that we can talk about um, points on a wave being completely out of phase if they're not two pi radians apart, but pi radians. So in other words, in our circle analogy, we've not gone all the way round, we've gone halfway round. So we're down here. So on this wave, we're talking about this point uh, being out of phase with that point. Yeah? 
halfway through. That makes it out of phase. So if we look at the diagram um, in yellow at the bottom right hand side of the screen there, um, let's take this point uh, P uh, as our reference point. Uh, let me see what else on there. What what on there is in phase with with P? A, right? and it's the only point that's in phase with P. Uh, what is out of phase? E certainly is. Anything else? D. D is out of phase as well. Right, it's half a cycle away. It works in both directions. Um, so something that's pi on 2 out of phase with P. D or, uh, C or B. C or B, yeah. It's not fully out of phase. It's not pi out of phase. It's halfway between the two. All right. That is completely out of phase with P, whereas that is only pi upon 2 out of phase. All right. If we looked at a point here, it would be pi upon 4 out of phase. All right. it is, it's just a measure of the fraction of 2 pi we are away from whatever our reference position is. That's all it is. And we can express that fraction down here uh, in this equation. All right, so our phase uh, angle, our phase difference, our phase separation, it will be described different ways in, in different books, uh, essentially saying it, uh, what fraction of um, a cycle, so what fraction of a wavelength are we through our cycle, which is 2 pi radians. Right, that's what that equation is saying. What fraction of one cycle are we away? And that's going to be, again, that's an equation that we will use off and on. Not a great deal, but off and on. Um, if you get into electronics, as you will at some stage, um, things like phase differences and so on will be important because different components in a circuit, capacitors, inductors, uh, when you've got an AC current, will introduce a phase change in your circuit. Okay, and you'll be describing it using this sort of terminology. Oh, how much more do I want to do? We'll do another couple of slides and then I think we're finished because we'll be getting on to the slightly more challenging bit. Um, polarization is one topic that is relatively easy, I think, to grasp in terms of wave motion. Um, and it is just looking at directions of oscillation. And this only applies to transverse waves. You cannot polarize a longitudinal wave. It is a meaningless concept. So sound waves, for instance, absolutely cannot be polarized. Whereas light, vibrations on a string, guitar string, whatever, can be. So transverse waves, we can polarize. Uh, longitudinal waves, we can't. Right? That's the basic message here. Uh, and the illustration is a fairly crude one. It's actually, again, producing a wave uh, in a piece of string. And you can just about manage this. Um, if you put your piece of string on the bench so you're forcing the issue somewhat uh, and then just sort of sliding your fingers backwards and forwards on the bench you get a polarised wave, right? It's still transverse, the oscillations are still at right angles to the wave motion but they're now all in one plane they're in the plane of the bench in terms of that example All right. whereas if you hold the piece of string up in air um, you know, even if you try and get it all in one plane, I guarantee that you won't manage it. Right? The vibrations are still going to be transverse, they're still at right angles to the direction of the wave motion along the string. But now they are at all sorts of angles, right? The wave is still going in that direction, but our transverse oscillations can now be oriented pretty much any angle in space. And that would be described as an unpolarized wave or non-polarized. 
All right, so that's polarization. Relatively straightforward, I think, when it comes to mechanical vibrations anyway. We'll come back to polarization a lot when we're looking at electromagnetic waves. Um, the concept is the same, except there we're looking at, um, you know, as I say, the oscillations in field strength of electric and magnetic fields. But we can still talk about polarization in the sense that we can make sure that the electric and magnetic fields are always oriented in the same direction. They're still oscillating, they're still changing in strength as a function of time or distance, but only ever in one direction. Whereas non-polarized light, uh, they're in all directions. So light we get direct from the sun, such as we've got on a day like today, is non-polarized. Whereas if it comes through, uh, comes to your eyes by reflection from a puddle on the ground, for instance, it will be polarized. Reflected light is polarized, and you'll get to the reasons for this in stage two, I guess. You'll get to that point, right? Because reflection will constrain the electric field part, and therefore it will drag the magnetic part with it it will constrain that to be in one particular direction with respect to the surface of the water that it's refracting from. Right? It's why polarized sunglasses work as effectively as they do. They are set up, surprise, surprise, uh, so that they cut out preferentially light that is polarized in the way that it will be if it's been reflected. So it preferentially cuts out reflected light, which is why they're as effective as they are. 